chapter 3 social institutions continuity and change having studied the structure and dynamics of population of india in chapter 2 we turn now to study of social institutions a population is not just a collection of separate unrelated individuals it is a society made of distinct but interlinked classes and communities of various kinds. These communities are sustained and regulated by social institutions and social relationships. In this chapter, we will be looking at three institutions that are central to Indian society, namely caste, tribe and family. Like any Indian, you already don't know that caste is the name of an ancient social institution that has been part of Indian history and culture for thousands of years. But like any Indian living in the 21st century, you also know that something called caste is definitely a part of Indian society today. To what extent are these two castes the one that is supposed to be part of India's past? and the one that is part of its present, the same thing. This is the question that we will try to answer in this section. Caste in the past. Caste is an institution uniquely associated with Indian subcontinent, while social arrangements producing similar effects have existed in other parts of the world. The exact form has not been found elsewhere. Although it is an institution characteristic of Hindu society, Caste has spread to the major non-Hindu communities of the Indian subcontinent. This is especially true of Muslims, Christians and Sikhs. As is well known, the English word caste is actually a borrowing from the Portuguese casta, meaning pure breed. The word refers to a broad institutional arrangement that in Indian languages, beginning with ancient Sanskrit, is referred to by two distinct terms, Varna and Jati. Varna literally color is name given to a fourfold division of society into Brahman, Kshatri, Vaish and Shudra. Though this excludes a significant section of population composed of the outcasts, foreigners, slaves, conquered peoples and others, sometimes referred to as Panchamas or fifth category. Jati is a generic term referring to species or kinds of anything ranging from inanimate objects to plants, animals and human beings. Jati is the word mostly used to refer to the institution of caste in Indian languages. Though it is interesting to note that increasingly Indian language speakers are beginning to use the word caste. The precise relationship between Varna and Jati has been subject of much speculation and debate among scholars. The most common interpretation is to treat Varna as a broad all India aggregative classification, while Jati is taken to be regional or local subclassification involving a much more complex system consisting of hundreds or even thousands of castes and subcastes. This means that while the four Varna classification is common to all of India, the Jati hierarchy has more local classifications that vary from region to region. Opinions also differ on the exact age of the caste system. It is generally agreed though that the four Varna classification is roughly 3000 years old. However, the caste system stood for different things in different time periods so that it is misleading to think that the same system continuing for 3000 years. In the earliest phase, in the late Vedic period roughly between 900 to 500 BC, the caste system was really a Varna system and consisted of only four major divisions. These divisions were not very elaborate or very rigid and they were not determined by birth. Movement across the categories seems to have not been only possible but quite common. It is only in the post-Vedic period that the caste became a rigid institution 
that is familiar to us and well known definitions the most commonly cited features of caste are following caste is determined by birth a child is born into the caste of its parents caste is never a matter of choice one can never change one's caste leave it or choose not to join it although there are instances where a person may be expelled from their caste membership in a caste involves strict rules about marriage caste groups are in the gamers that is marriage is restricted to members of the group caste membership also involves rules about food and food sharing what kinds of food may or may not be eaten is prescribed and who one may share food with is also specified caste involves a system consisting of many castes arranged in a hierarchy of rank and status in theory every person has a caste and every caste has a specified place in the hierarchy of all castes while the hierarchical position of many castes particularly in the middle ranks may vary from region to region there is always a hierarchy caste also involves a division within themselves caste almost always have sub caste and sometimes sub caste may also have sub sub caste this is referred to as segmental organization caste were originally traditionally linked to occupations a person born into a caste could not only practice the occupation associated with that caste so that occupations were hereditary that is passed on from generation to generation on the other hand particular occupation could only be pursued by caste associated with it members of other caste should not enter the occupation these features are prescribed rules found in ancient scriptural text since these prescriptions were not always practiced we cannot say to what extent these rules actually determined the empirical reality of caste its concrete meaning for people living at that time as you can see most of the prescriptions involved prohibitions or restrictions of various sorts it is also very clear from the historical evidence that caste was very unequal situation some caste benefited greatly from the system while others were condemned to a life of endless labor and subordination most important once caste became rigidly determined by birth it was in principle impossible for a person to ever change their life circumstances whether they deserved it or not an upper caste person would always have high status while a lower caste person would always have low status theoretically the caste system can be understood as a combination of two sets of principles one based on difference and separation and other are holism and hierarchy each caste is supposed to be different from and is therefore strictly separated from every other caste many of the scriptural rule of caste are the designed to prevent mixing of caste rules changing from marriage food sharing and social interaction social interaction to occupation on the other hand these different and separated caste do not have an individual existence they can only exist in relation to a larger whole the totality of society consisting of all caste further this societal whole or system is a hierarchical rather than egalitarian system each individual caste occupies not just a distinct place but also an order rank a particular position in a ladder like arrangement going from highest to lowest the hierarchical ordering of caste is based on the distinction between purity and pollution this is division between something believed to be closer to the sacred and something believed to be distant from or opposed to the sacred therefore considered ritually polluting castes that are considered ritually pure have high status while those considered less pure or impure have low status as in all societies material power is closely associated with social status so that those in power tend to be a high status and vice versa historians believe that those who were defeated in wars were often assigned low caste status finally castes are not only unequal to each other in ritual terms they are also 
supposed to be complementary and non-competing groups. In other words, each caste has its own place in the system, which cannot be taken by other caste. Since caste is also linked with occupation, the system functions as social division of labor, except that, in principle, it allows no mobility. Not surprisingly, our sources of knowledge about the past and especially the ancient past are inadequate. It is difficult to be very certain about what things were like at that time, or the reason why some traditions and practices came to be established. But even if we knew all this, it still cannot tell us about what should be done today, as because something happened in the past or is part of our tradition, it is not necessarily right or wrong forever. Every age has to think afresh about such situations and come to its own collective decision about its social institutions. Colonialism and caste, compared to the ancient past, we know a lot more about caste in our recent history. If modern history is taken to begin with the 19th century, then Indian independence in 1947 offers a natural dividing line between the colonial period and the post-independence or post-colonial period. The present form of caste as a social institution has been shaped very strongly by both the colonial period as well as the rapid changes that have come about in independent India. Scholars have agreed that all major institutions and especially the institution of caste underwent major changes during colonial period. In fact, some scholars argue that what we know today as caste is more a product of colonialism than of ancient Indian tradition. Not all of the changes brought about were intended or deliberate. Initially, British administrators began by trying to understand the complexities of caste in an effort to learn how to govern the country efficiently. Some of these efforts took shape of very methodological and intense surveys and reports on the customs and manners of various tribes and castes all over the country. Many British administrative officials were also amateur ethnologists and took great interest in pursuing such surveys and studies. But by far, the most important official effort to collect information on caste was through census. First begun in 1860s, census became a regular 10 year exercise conducted by British Indian government from 1881 onwards. The 1901 census under the direction of Herbert Risley was particularly important as it sought to collect information on social hierarchy of caste the social order of precedence in particular regions as to the position of each caste in the rank order. This effort had a huge impact on social perception of caste and hundreds of petitions were addressed to the census commissioner by representatives of different castes claiming a higher position in social scale and offering historical and scriptural evidence for their claims. Overall scholars feel that this kind of direct attempt to count caste and to officially record caste status changed the institution itself. Before this kind of intervention, caste identity had been much more fluid and less rigid. Once they began to be counted and recorded, caste began to take new life. Other interventions by the colonial state also had an impact on the institution. The land revenue settlements and related arrangements and laws served to give legal recognition to the customary rights of the upper caste. These castes now became landowners in the modern sense, rather than feudal classes with claims on the produce of the land or claims to revenue or tribute of various kinds. Large scale irrigation schemes like the ones in Punjab were accompanied by efforts to settle populations there, and these also had a caste dimension. At the other end of the scale, towards the end of colonial period, the administration also took an interest in the welfare of downtrodden castes, referred to as different classes at that time. It was a part of these efforts that the Government of India Act of 1935 was passed, which gave legal recognition to the list of schedules of castes and tribes. 
marked out of special treatment by the state. This is how the scheduled tribes and scheduled caste came into being. Caste at the bottom of the hierarchy, that's a word severe discrimination, including all the so called untouchable castes, were included among scheduled castes. Thus, colonialism brought about major changes in the institution of caste. Perhaps it would be more accurate that the institution of caste underwent fundamental changes during the colonial period. Not just India, but the whole world was undergoing rapid change during this period due to spread of capitalism and modernity. Caste in the present Indian independence in 1947 marked a big but ultimately only partial break with the colonial past. Caste considerations had inevitably played a role in the mass mobilization of national movement. Efforts to organize the depressed classes and particularly the untouchable caste predated the nationalist movement having begun in the second half of the 19th century. This was initiative taken from both ends of the caste spectrum by upper caste progressive reformers as well as by members of the lower caste such as Mahatma, Jyoti Phule and Baba Sahib Ambedkar in Western India, Ayyan Kali, Sri Narayan Guru, Ayyuthi Das and Feriyar in the South. Both Mahatma Gandhi and Baba Sahib Ambedkar began organizing protests against untouchability from 1920s onwards. Anti-untouchability programs became a significant part of Congress agenda so that by the time independence was on the horizon, there was a broad agreement across the spectrum of nationalist movement to abolish caste distinctions. The dominant view in the nationalist movement was to treat caste as a social level and as a colonial ploy to divide Indians, but the nationalist leaders above all, Mahatma Gandhi, were able to simultaneously work for the upliftment of lower caste, advocate the abolition of untouchability and other caste restrictions and at the same time reassure the land knowing upper caste that their interest too would be looked after. Post-independence India had state inherited and reflected these contradictions. On the one hand, the state was committed to abolition of caste and explicitly wrote into constitution. On the other hand, the state was both unable and unwilling to push through radical reforms which would have undermined the economic basis of caste inequality. At another level, the state assumed that if it operated in a caste-blind manner, this would automatically lead to undermining of caste-based privileges and eventual evolution of the institution. For example, appointments to government jobs took no account of caste, thus leaving the well-educated upper caste and the ill-educated or often illiterate lower caste to compete on equal terms. The only exception to this was the form of reservations for scheduled caste and scheduled tribes. In other words, in the decades immediately after independence, the state did not make sufficient effort to deal with the fact that the upper caste and lower caste were far from equal in economic and educational terms. The development activity of the state and the growth of private industry also affected caste and directly through speeding up of intensification of economic change. Modern industry created all kinds of new jobs for which there were no caste rules, urbanization and the conditions of collective living in the cities were made it difficult for caste segregated patterns of social interaction to survive. At a different level, modern educated Indians attracted to the liberal ideas of individualism and meritocracy began to abandon the more extreme caste practices. On the other hand, it was just remarkable how resilient caste proved to be. Recruitment to industrial jobs whether in the textile mills of Mumbai, the jute mills of Kolkata or elsewhere continued to be organized along caste and kinship based lines. The middlemen who recruited labor for factories tended to recruit them for their own caste and region so that particular departments of shop floors were often dominated by specific caste. Prejudice against untouchables remained quite long strong and was not absent from the city, though not as extreme as it could be in village. Not surprisingly, 
it was in the cultural and domestic spheres that caste has proved strongest endogamy or the practice of marrying within the caste remained largely unaffected by modernization and change even today most marriages takes place within caste boundaries also there are more inter caste marriages while some boundaries may have become more flexible or porous the border between groups of caste and similar socio economic status are still heavily patrolled for example inter caste marriages within the upper caste may be more likely now than before but marriages between an upper caste and backward or scheduled caste person remain rare even today something similar may have occurred with regard to rules of food sharing perhaps the most eventful and important sphere of change has been not of politics from its very beginnings in independent india democratic politics has been deeply conditioned by caste while its functioning has become more and more complex and hard to predict it cannot be denied that caste remains central to electoral politics since 1980s we have also seen the emergence of explicitly caste based political parties in the early general elections it seemed as though caste solidaries were decisive in winning elections but the situation soon got very complicated as parties competed with each other in utilizing the same kind of caste calculus sociologists and social anthropologists point many new concepts to try to understand the process of change perhaps the most common of the are sanskritization and dominant caste both contributed by mn srivanivas but discussed extensively and criticized by other scholars sanskritization is a show process whereby members of a caste attempt to raise their own social status by adopting the ritual domestic and social practices of a caste of higher status also this phenomenon is an old one and predates independence and perhaps even in the colonial period it has intensified in recent times patterns for emulation chosen for most often were the brahmin or kshatriya caste practices included adopting vegetarianism wearing of sacred thread performance of specific prayers and religious ceremonies and so on sanskritization usually accompanies or follows a rise in the economic status of the caste attempting it though it may also occur independently subsequent research has led to many modifications and revisions being suggested for this concept this include the argument that sanskritization may be a defiant claiming of previously prohibited ritual social privileges rather than flattering invitation of the upper caste by lower caste dominant caste is a term used to refer to those castes which had a large population and were granted land rights by partial land reforms effected after independence the land reforms took away rights from the erstwhile claimants and the upper caste the who were essentially landlords in the sense that they played no part in agricultural economy other than claiming their rent they frequently did not live in the village either but were based in towns and cities these lands right now came to be vested in the next layer of claimants those who were involved in the management of agriculture but were not themselves in the cultivators these intermediate castes in turn dependent on the labor of the lower caste including especially the untouchable caste for tilling and tending the land however once they got the land rights they acquired considerable economic power their large numbers also gave them political power in the era of electoral democracy based on universal adult franchise thus the intermediate caste became the dominant caste in the countryside and played a decisive role in regional politics and agrarian economy example of such dominant caste include the yadavs of bihar of uttar pradesh the vokagalis of karnataka the reddies and khamas of andhra pradesh the marathas of maharashtra the jats of punjab haryana and other pradesh and the padiyas of gujarat one of the most yet paradoxical changes in the caste system is the contemporary period is that it has intended to become invisible for the upper caste urban and middle and upper classes for these groups who have benefited the most from the developmental policies of the post colonial area caste has appeared to decline in significance precisely 
because it has done its job so well. The caste status had been crucial in ensuring that these groups had the necessary economic and educational resources to take full advantage of opportunities offered by rapid development. In particular, the upper caste elite were able to benefit from subsidized public education, especially professional education in science, technology, medicine and management. At the same time, they were also able to take advantage of expansion of sector jobs in the early decades after independence. In this initial period, their lead over the rest of society ensured that they did not face any serious competition as their privileged status got consolidated in the second and third generations. These groups began to believe that their advancement had little to do with caste. Certainly for the third generation from these groups, their economic and educational capital alone is quite sufficient to ensure that they will continue to get the best in terms of life chances. For this group, it now seems that caste plays no part in their public lives. Being limited to personal sphere of religious practice of marriage or and kinship, however, a further complication is introduced by the fact that this is a differentiated group. Although the privileged as a group are overwhelmingly upper caste, not all upper caste people are privileged, some being poor. For the so-called scheduled caste and tribes and the backward caste, the opposite has happened. For them, caste has become all too visible. Indeed, their caste are intended to eclipse the other dimensions of their identities because they have no inherited educational and social capital and because they must compete with an already entrenched upper caste group, they cannot afford to abandon their caste identity for it is one of the few collective assets they have. Moreover, they continue to suffer from discrimination of various kinds. The policies of reservation and other forms of protective discrimination instituted by the state in response to political pressure serve as their lifelines. But using this lifeline tends to make their caste the all-important and often only aspect of their identity that the world recognizes the just opposition of these two groups. A seemingly casteless upper caste group and apparently caste-defined lower caste group is one of the central aspects of the institution of caste in the present tribal communities. Tribe is a modern term for communities that are very old, being among the oldest inhabitants of the subcontinent. Tribes in India have generally been defined in terms of what they were not. Tribes were communities that did not practice a religion with a written text, did not have a state or political form of normal kind, did not have sharp classes, divisions, and most important, they did not have caste and were neither Hindus nor peasants. The term was introduced in the colonial area. The use of single term for a very disparate set of communities was more a matter of administrative convenience. Classification of tribal societies in terms of positive characteristics, tribes have been classified according to their permanent and acquired traits. Permanent traits include region, language, physical characteristics, and ecological habitat. Permanent traits The tribal population of India is widely dispersed. There are also concentration of certain regions. About 85% of tribal population lives in Middle India. A wide band stretching from Gujarat and Rajasthan in the west to West Bengal and Odisha in the east, with Madhya Pradesh, Jharkhand, Chhattisgarh, and parts of Maharashtra and Andhra Pradesh forming the heart of this region. Of the remaining 15% over 11% is in the northeastern states, leaving only over 3% in the rest of India. If we look at the share of tribal in the state population, then the northeastern states have the highest concentrations, with all states except Assam having concentration of more than 30%, and some like Arunachal Pradesh, Meghalaya, Mizoram, and Nagaland is more than 60% and up to 95% of tribal population. In the rest of the country, however, tribal population is very small, being less than 12% in all states, except Odisha and Madhya Pradesh. The ecological habitats covered includes hills, forest, rural plains, and urban industrial areas. In terms of language, 
types are characterized into four categories two of them indoarian and davidian are shared by the rest of the population as well and tries account for only about 1% of the former and 3% of the latter the other two languages the austric and tibeto burman are primary spoken by tribals who account for all of the first and over 80s of the second group in the physical racial terms tribes are classified under the negrito australoid mongoloid dravidian and aryan categories the last two were again shared with the rest of the population of india in terms of size tribes vary a great deal ranging about 7 million to some and the manis islanders who may number less than 100 persons the biggest tribes are the gonds bhils santhals orangs minas bodos and mundas all of whom are at least a million strong the total population of tribes amounts to 8.2 percent of the population of india or about 84 million persons according to 2001 census according to census report 2011 it is 8.6 percent of the population of india or about 104 million tribal persons in the country acquired traits classification based on acquired traits used to main criteria mode of livelihood and extent of incorporation into hindu society or a combination of the two on the basis of livelihood tribes can be categorized into fishermen food gatherers hunters shifting cultivators peasants and plantation and industrial workers however the dominant classification both in academic sociology as well as in politics and public affairs is the degree of assimilation into hindu society assimilation can be seen either from the point of view of the tribes or from the point of view of the dominant hindu mainstream from the tribe point of view apart from the extent of assimilation attitude towards hindu society is also a major criteria the differentiation between tribes that are positively inclined toward hinduism and those who resist or oppose it from the mainstream point of view tribes may be viewed in terms of the status accorded to them in the hindu society ranging from the high status given to some to the generally low status accorded to most try the career of a concept during 1960s scholars debated whether tribes should be seen as one end of the continuum with caste based hindu peace in society or whether they were an altogether different kind of community those who argued over the continuum saw tribes not being fundamentally different from caste peace in society but mainly less stratified and with a more community based rather than individual notion of resource ownership however opponents argued that tribes were wholly different from caste because they had no notion of purity and pollution which is central to the caste system in short the argument for a tribe caste distinction was founded on the assumed cultural differences between hindu castes with their beliefs in purity and pollution and hierarchical integration and animist tribals with their more egalitarian and kinship based modes of social organization by 1970s all the major definitions of tribe were shown to be faulty it was pointed out that the tribe peasantry distinction does not hold in terms of any commonly advanced criteria size isolation religion and means of livelihood some indian tribes like santhal gonds and bhils are very large and spread over extensive territory not and tribes like munda os and others have long since turned to settled agriculture and even hunting gathering tribes like the birhors of bihar employ specialized households to make baskets press oil etc it has also been pointed out in number of cases that in absence of other alternatives caste have turned to hunting and gathering the discussion on caste tribe differences was accompanied by a large body of literature on the mechanisms through which tribes were absorbed into hindu society through the ages 
through sensitization, acceptance into the Shudra, world following conquest by caste Hindus, through acculturation, and so on. The whole span of Indian history was often seen as an absorption of different tribal groups into caste Hindu society at varying levels of hierarchy as their lands were colonized and forests cut down. This is seen as either natural, parallel to the process by which all groups are assimilated into Hinduism as sex, or it is seen as exploitative. The early school of anthropologists tended to emphasize the cultural aspects of tribal absorption into the mainstream, while the later writers have concentrated on the exploitative and political nature of the incorporation. Some scholars have also argued that there is no coherent basis for treating tribes as pristine, original or pure societies uncontaminated by civilization. They propose instead that tribes should be seen as secondary phenomena arising out of exploitative and colonialist contact between pre-existing states and non-state groups like the tribals. The contact itself creates an ideology of tribalism. The tribal group begin to define themselves as tribal in order to distinguish themselves from the newly encountered others. Nevertheless, the idea that tribes are like Stone Age, hunting and gathering societies that have remained untouched by time is still common. Even though this has not been true for a long time, to begin with, Adivasis were not always the oppressed groups they are now. There were several gold kingdoms and in central India such that of Gadhamandla or Chanda. Many of the so-called Rajput kingdoms of central and western India actually emerged through a process of stratification among Adivasi communities themselves. Adivasis often exercised dominance over the plains people through their capacity to raid them and trading forest produce, salt and elephants. Moreover, the capitalist economies drive to exploit forest resources and minerals and to recruit cheap labor as broad tribal societies in contact with mainstream society a long time ago. Mainstream attitude towards tribe Although the early anthropological work of colonial era and described tribes has isolated cohesive communities, colonialism had already brought irrevocable changes in the world. On the political and economic front, tribal societies were faced with incursion of moneylenders. They were also losing their land to non-tribal immigrant settlers and their access to forests because of the government policy of reservation of forest and the introduction of mining operations. Unlike other areas where land rent was a primary source of surplus extraction in these hilly and forested areas, it was mostly a creation of natural resources, forests and minerals, which was the main source of income for the colonial government. Following the various rebellions in tribal areas in the 18th and 19th century, the colonial government set up excluded and partially excluded areas where the entry of non-tribals were prohibited or regulated. In these areas, the British favored indirect rule through local kings or headmen. The famous isolation versus integration debate of 1940s built upon this standard picture of tribal societies as isolated holes. The isolationist side argued that travels needed protection from traders, moneylenders, and Hindu and Krishna missionaries, all of whom were intent on reducing travels to de-travelize landless labor. Integrationists, on the other hand, argued that travels were mainly backward Hindus, and their problems had to be addressed within the same framework as that of backward classes. This opposition dominated the constituent assembly debates which were finally settled along the lines of a compromise which advocated welfare schemes that would enable controlled integration. The subsequent schemes for tribal development, five-year plans, tribal sub-plans, tribal welfare blocks, special multipurpose area schemes, 
all continue with this mode of thinking but the basic issue here is that the integration of tribes has neglected their own needs and desires integration has been on terms of mainstream society and for their own benefit tribal societies have had their lands forests taken away and their communities shattered in the name of development national development versus tribal development the imperatives of development have gathered governed attitudes towards tribes and shaped the policies of the state national development particularly in the nehruvian area era involved the building of large dams factories and mines because the tribals were located in mineral rich and forest covered parts of the country tribals have paid a disproportionate price for the development of the rest of indian society this kind of development has benefited the mainstream at the expense of the tribes the process of dispossessing tribals of their land has occurred as a necessary by product of the exploitation of minerals and utilization of favorable sites for setting up hydroelectric power plants many of which were in tribal areas the loss of the forest on which the most tribal communities depended has been a major blow forest started to be systematically exploited in british times and the trend continued after independence the coming of private property in land has also adversely affected tribals whose community based forms of collective ownership were placed at a disadvantage in the new system the most recent such example is the series of dams being built on narmada here most of the cost and benefit seems to flow disproportionately to different communities and region many tribal concentration regions and states have also been experiencing the problem of heavy immigration of non tribals in response to the pressures of development this threatens to disrupt and overwhelm tribal communities and cultures besides accelerating the process of exploitation of tribals the industrial areas of jharkhand for example have suffered a dilution of the tribal share of population but the most dramatic cases are probably in the northeast states like tripura had the tribal share of its population halved within a single decade that is reducing them to a minority similar pressure is being felt by arunachal pradesh tribal identity today pose incorporation of tribal communities into mainstream processes had its impact on tribal culture and society as much as it is coming tribal identities today are formed by these international process rather than pre modal characteristics peculiar to tribes because the interaction with the mainstream has generally been on terms favorable unfavorable to the tribal communities many tribal identities today are centered on the ideas of resistance and opposition to the overwhelming force of the non tribal world the positive impact of successes such as achievement of statehood for jharkhand and chhatisgarh after a long struggle and moderated by containing problems many of the state of northeast for example have been living for decades under special laws that limit the civil liberties of citizens the citizens of states like manipur and nagaland don't have the same rights as other citizens of india because their states have been declared as disturbed areas the vicious circle of armed rebellions provoking state repression which in turn fuels for the rebellions has taken a heavy toll on the economy culture and society of northeastern states in other the part of the country jharkhand and chhatisgarh are yet to make full use of their new found statehood and political system there is not autonomous of large structures in which tribes are powerless another significant development is the gradual emergence of an 
educated middle class among tribal communities more visible is in the northeastern states this is now a segment beginning to be seen in the rest country as well with policies of reservation education is creating an urbanized professional class as tribal societies get more differentiated that is developed class and other divisions within themselves different bases are growing for their assertion and tribal identity two broad sets of issues have been most important in giving rise to tribal movements these are issues relating to control over vital economic resources like land and especially forest and issues relating to matters of ethnic cultural identity the two can often go together but with differentiation of tribal society they may also diverge the reasons why the middle classes within tribal societies may assert their tribal identity may be different from the reasons why poor and uneducated tribes join the tribal movements as with any other community it is the relationship between these kind of internal dynamics and external forces that will shape in future family and kinship each one of us is born into a family and most of us spend long years within it usually we feel very strongly about our family sometimes we feel very good about our parents grandparents siblings uncles aunts and cousins whereas at others we don't on the one hand we resent their interference and yet we miss their overbearing ways when we are away from them the family is a space of great warmth and care it has also been site of bitter conflicts injustice and even violence female infanticide violent conflict between brothers over property and ugly legal disputes are as much as part of family and kinship as are stories of compassion sacrifice and care the structure of the family can be studied both as a social institution in itself and also in its relationship to other social institutions of society in itself a family can be defined as nuclear as extended it can be male headed or female headed a line of descent can be matrilineal or patrilineal this internal structure of the family is usually related to other structures of society namely political economic cultural etc thus the migration of men from the villages to the himalayan region can lead to an unusual proportion of women headed families in the village or the work schedules of young parents in the software industry in india may lead to increasing number of grandparents moving in as caregivers to young grandchildren the composition of family and its structure thereby changes and these changes can be understood in relation to other changes in society the family is linked to the economic political cultural and educational spheres the family is an integral part of our lives we take it for granted we also assume that other people's families must be like our own as we saw however families have different structures and these structures change sometimes these changes occur accidentally when a war takes place or people migrate in search of work sometimes these changes are purposely brought out or when young people decide to choose their spouses instead of letting elders decide or when same sex love is expressed openly in society it is evident from kind of changes that takes place that not only have family structures change but cultural ideas norms and values also change these changes are however not so easy to bring about both history and contemporary times such as that often change in family and marriage norms have resisted violently the family has many dimensions to it in india however discussions on the family has often revolved around nuclear and extended family nuclear and extended family a nuclear family consists of only one set of parents and their children an extended family commonly known as joint family can take different forms but has more than one couple and more often more than two generations living together this could be a set of brothers with their individual families or an elderly couple with their sons and grandsons and their respective families the extended family often is seen 
asymptotic of India and this by no means the dominant form now or earlier it was confined to certain sections and certain regions of the community indeed the term joint family itself is not a native category as ip desai observes the expression joint family is not a translation of any indian word like that it is interesting to note that the words used for joint family in most of the indian languages are equivalents of the translation of english word joint family a diverse form of the family studies have shown that diverse family forms are found in different societies with regard to the rule of residence some societies are matrilocal in their marriage and family customs while others are patrilocal in the first case newly married couples stay with the woman's parents where in the second case the couple lives with the man's parents with regard to the rules of inheritance matrilineal societies pass on property from mother to daughter while patrilineal societies do so from father to son a patriarchal family structure exists where the men exercise authority and dominance and matriarchy where the women play a similarly dominant role however matriarchy unlike patriarchy has been a theoretical rather than an empirical concept there is no historical or anthropological evidence of matriarchy that is societies where women exercise dominance however there do exist matrilineal societies that is societies where women inherit property from their mothers and do not exercise control over it nor are the decision makers in public affairs the account of khasi matrilineity clarifies the distinction between matrilineal and matriarchy it shows the structural tensions created by matrilineal systems with both affect men and women in khasi society today